Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about undernutrition, malnutrition, Porchiocor, marasmus and dietary deficiencies in pediatric patients. In the first part we will talk about undernutrition, also called undernourishment. In the second part we will talk about malnutrition and the difference to undernutrition and in the last part we will talk about dietary deficiencies especially in pediatric patients. Undernutrition is a form of malnutrition which is characterized by the chronic intake of insufficient amounts of food and the essential components it contains. This is a type of quantitative malnutrition as the food quality might be good but the amount consumed is too little. It is thought that worldwide around 850 million people are suffering from undernutrition, most of which live in poor countries. However, in the industrial countries, anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa are major causes of undernutrition. If you want to know more about those and other eating disorders, make sure to see my video on that as well. The diagnosis of undernutrition is done by measuring the height and weight of the individual. In children, a reduced weight is often observed together with a smaller height than the child of a certain age group should usually have reached. To check the specific age-related height, there are growth charts from the WHO available to everyone on the webpage. Not everyone affected by undernutrition will develop symptoms, however, some do. Symptoms include, besides a low weight and smaller than normally expected height, also fatigue, weakness, apathy, lack of drive, in some cases cognitive impairment, as well as protein, fat, vitamin, trace element and mineral deficiencies, about which we will talk more later. Also, a protruding abdomen can be seen in some patients, as for example, due to a quashiorcor ascites, which is due to a low protein and high carbohydrate diet. This diet leads to hypoalbuminemia, which in turn decreases the colloid osmotic pressure, which leads to generalized edema, also called anasarca. Some patients also experience meteorismus, so excess intestinal gas, by a pathological change in the intestinal flora. Other symptoms include endocrine disturbances, as a high level of growth hormone, low level of alkaline phosphatase, and the development of Cushing syndrome. In laboratory studies, often low total protein, hypernatremia and hypokalemia can be observed. In the next point, I would like to talk about malnutrition. Malnutrition and undernutrition are often used interchangingly, but this is not entirely correct. Undernutrition is a part of malnutrition, but malnutrition is a much wider umbrella term for any kind of unbalanced diet. Another subgroup of malnutrition is overnutrition. It usually goes hand in hand with obesity, and if you want to know more about childhood obesity and metabolic syndrome, you can see our video on that also in the pediatrics playlist if you like. Malnutrition can also be caused by different things than solely the lack of sufficient intake of food. Malnutrition can be the excess intake of one kind of food, but a lack of trace elements, vitamins or proteins, for example. Malnutrition can also be caused by disturbances in the processing of the food that is taken in, as in absorption or digestive problems. To bring it down to one sentence, malnutrition is when the body is deprived of a certain part of the essential nutrients, 
even though there might be a sufficient total caloric intake. It essentially means a chronic intake of an imbalanced diet. This can, for example, lead to a goiter formation, anemia or scurvy. Malnutrition can be classified into three groups, according to the severity and amount of weight deficit. Mild malnutrition or hypotrophia is characterized by up to 20% deficit in weight. Moderate malnutrition is characterized by 20 to 40% in weight deficit and severe malnutrition or atrophia or marasmus is characterized by over 40% in weight deficit. In the next point, I would like to talk about undernutrition and its avoidance, specifically in children under the age of 6 months. Those children are recommended to be fed with breast milk, which provides the child with a low but highly bioavailable form of protein, with essential fatty acids as well as highly bioavailable forms of calcium, iron and zinc, which are essential for an adequate development of the child. Right after birth, for around three days, the mother provides the baby with a special breast milk called colostrum. This is a thicker, more viscous type of milk that is especially high in protein and lower in fat. After the third day, the milk becomes more liquid and its components change and are adapted for the changing needs of the growing baby. To make sure that the baby receives adequate milk amounts, the stool of the baby should be observed, as well as the weight gain. Initially, babies lose up to 7% of their birth weight, which should be regained with sufficient milk supply by the 10th day of life. A sign for insufficient milk intake is besides insufficient weight gain, also breastfeeding jaundice, which is characterized by increased levels of unconjugated bilirubin. In the next part, I would like to talk about dietary guidelines for children older than two years to avoid undernourishment or malnourishment. For this age group, it is recommended for the child to have three regular meals with the addition of snacks according to appetite, activity and the needs of the growing child. The key nutrient in this age group is complex carbohydrates, which should make up around 60% of the daily calories. Those are mainly whole grain and high fiber foods. Simple carbohydrates and sugars, for example in the form of cupcakes and co, should make up less than 10% of the child's diet. It is also important to note that fat and sodium should be limited. In this age group, it is also important to develop a healthy behavior towards mealtimes, for example, by avoiding the intake of food while watching TV and to encourage an appetite-directed control of portion sizes. Pediatric undernutrition affects around 5-10% to of young children and protein energy malnutrition, short PEM, is the leading cause of death in children under the age of 5. Protein energy malnutrition is a group of conditions caused by different degrees of protein and calorie deficiency. Primary PEM, or protein energy malnutrition, is caused by social or economic factors that result in a lack of food, so in most cases, poverty. Secondary PEM is due to various conditions. This group includes infections, trauma and cancer, which all increase the caloric requirements. Malabsorption and digestive disorders lead to malabsorption and so even though enough food is offered to the child, they will reach undernutrition over time. Another factor is the reduced intake of calories for example due to anorexia, cancer or other diseases that might decrease the child's appetite. 
it is also possible for a combination of those to occur. The most severe form of protein energy malnutrition is called marasmus. This is also often associated with chronic diseases, such as cystic fibrosis, tuberculosis, cancer, AIDS or celiac disease. The most obvious clinical sign is a severe decrease of body weight to less than the 50th percentile for the specific age group, or less than 70% of the ideal body weight for the height and age of the individual. Also loss of muscle mass and subcutaneous fat can be seen. Other factors specific for marasmus you can see on the poster. Also the skin is usually dry and thin, the hair often becomes colorless, thin and decreased amounts of hair can be seen on the head. Other signs are bradycardia and hypothermia, which can be life-threatening. Affected individuals are also often more prone to infections, especially pneumonias and gastroenteritis. In the next point, I would like to talk about the treatment of undernourished patients. The gastrointestinal tract may not tolerate tolerate rapid increase of food, so the nutritional rehabilitation should occur slowly and in a hospital setting. It also has to be kept in mind that intravenous fluids may lead to respiratory failure or heart failure, so they should be avoided initially. If the child develops edema during the increase in calories, the caloric intake should be maintained stably until the edema resolves. For the initiation of caloric intake, it is recommended to start at around 20% above the child's recent intake of food. If it is not possible to obtain an anamnesis, around 50 to 70% of the normal intake of calories are a starting point. After that, the caloric intake can be increased by 10 to 20% per day. However, close monitoring of the laboratory and clinical signs is necessary. It is also essential to monitor the electrolyte levels, as well as the cardiac function, edema and signs of feeding intolerance. And if any of that occurs, the caloric intake should not be increased until the child's monitoring stabilizes. In the next and last part, I would like to talk a little bit about specific vitamin deficiencies in children and the clinical signs of the specific vitamins. Vitamin C deficiency usually presents with fatigue, being more prone to getting infections, general weakness, pain in the joints and in severe cases bleeding of the gums and disturbances in wound healing. Citrus fruits, but also herbs and broccoli are especially rich in vitamin C. Vitamin D deficiency shows with increased nervousness, decrease in bone density or in children rickets, weak musculature and decrease in teeth formation. Vitamin D is formed by the body itself, but only under the influence of sufficient amounts of sunlight. In some areas of the world, with lack of sufficient sunlight to provide the body with enough vitamin D, it might be necessary to supplement it after talking to a doctor. Vitamin B1 deficiency shows with hypotension and syncopes and neurological disturbances as tingling sensations and cramps. Vitamin B6 deficiency shows with changes in the skin color rashes and broken lips, as well as inflammations of the skin and gums, loss of appetite, insomnia, irritability and depression. Salmon, for example, is rich in vitamin B6, so consumption of it is recommended, or for vegetarian or vegan patients, a supplementation can be recommended. It is important to consult a specialist before the intake of vitamins, as further investigations of the origin of a lack of vitamin despite sufficient intake can be necessary. That's it for this video, I hope it was helpful and if you like our channel, please subscribe.
Thank you very much.